Okay, let's get started, shall we? Um, you see the slide in front of you for Narnia. My son, Jordan, loved C.S. Lewis. In fact, when we attended uh, an event at Lubbock Christian University in, I would say, March of 2013, Dr. Alistair McGrath, who is the uh, scholar, Ph.D. in uh, molecular biophysics, uh, teaches at Oxford. He was here speaking, and so we got to sit in on an intimate uh, time with Dr. McGrath, and he shared, of course, Lewis, C.S. Lewis, entered Oxford as an atheist during that time, <clears throat> professed his faith in Christ. McGrath did the same thing, entered Oxford as an avowed atheist. Through that time, as he considered science and empirical truth, found Christ to be exactly who he said he was. So there were some parallels between McGrath and Lewis, and McGrath mentioned someone he knew who knew C.S. Lewis. Jordan, he thought that was awesome. I still remember after the event, he said, Dad, we have seen somebody who knew somebody who knew C.S. Lewis. <laughs> he was so excited. So, Jordan, from time to time, he loved the Chronicle Narnias. Obviously, Lewis authored those. And sometimes Jordan would, we could just hear him from his bedroom shout, for Narnia! And so over time, it became a cry for battle, a cry for victory. And so many times, well, almost all the time, when I speak on behalf, I, I, I'm called upon to give this talk on the topic of suicide, suicide intervention, I will just use that phrase. People will ask me, why do you do that for Narnia, for Aslan, for Christ, for the cross, for the empty tomb? For the battle for victory. All of that is summed up in that phrase for Narnia. Now, let me qualify this. We're videoing this tonight um, because I continue to be invited to different places to speak. I have two high schools I'll be speaking at uh, in, in two weeks. Um, a group from uh, out of town has said, is there a video that you could send us so that we could uh, uh, allow our supervisors to principals to view that? so forth and so on. So tonight, I may uh, use some things that I normally say to students, and I'll qualify that, but I need to put those things in this so that those folks can uh, understand with greater context uh, my talk to junior high and high school students, or in the case at Wayland University this morning, to college students. So first thing I always do is I introduce my family. Now, most, if not all of you, know my family. This is from July 2012. It's five years old, but for obvious reasons, it's one of the last family photos we have. And so I tell people, that's me on the left. <laughs> I've aged 100 years since then. Obviously, Kelsey beside me, uh, she now lives in Branson. Um, Michelle in the middle, my far better half, uh, Macy there, uh, second from the right, and then my son, Jordan. And I refer to his tattoo. He had that tattoo around his forearm. Uh, in Hebrew, it says, die to self. And he would use, he designed it himself. It was very unique. Of course, he's an artist, very creative. And um, uh, many people uh, got a tattoo just like that. Uh, but he would use it to witness people because obviously people would say, what does that mean? Just like they do with mine, all the time. And he would tell them, die to self, and he would use Paul's words in Galatians 2, I have been crucified with Christ, therefore it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And he would use that story to share his faith. Mine, in Hebrew, says the Lord is my shepherd. Now, I swore I would never, ever, ever get a tattoo Part of it is because it hurt. It hurt. Listen, the big burly guys, they're tatted all over them, and they got that needle, and I'm <laughs> crying. Tears going I'm trying not to show them how much it hurts. But anyway, the other reason was that so many people have tattoos today. To be unique, you don't get a tattoo. Uh, and so, but in honor of my son and to be able to share my faith, I did. Um, the 23rd Psalm, especially that first phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, 
helped me not lose my mind. I can tell you a number of times I was on the ground in the fetal position on the edge of a psychological cliff and I would say over and over, the Lord is my shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd because Satan was filling me with lies, filling my mind with, with guilt and hate and anger and confusion and doubt and I simply had to focus on my true north, the word of God. And so I repeated that over and over and over again. The Lord is my shepherd. And so every week, at least one, usually more than that, person asks me, what is that? And I tell them, did it today again. The Lord is my shepherd and have that opportunity. So what I do is I let them know. Before May of 2013, suicide was just an abstract topic, probably like it is for you. And I always tell them I'm, I want to address two audiences, two audiences that I hope to connect with tonight. The first audience is probably the majority of you. That audience is, uh, they're glad they're here. It's, uh, it's not a topic they think about very much. Uh, depression, suicide, those things. They think about it when it comes up. If they hear of someone who has taken their life uh, at maybe a high school or, or a friend or something like that. But it's situational. We think about it when it comes up. And, uh, and you know what? You're glad you're here. Perhaps you'll get a, a few tools to use if and when you encounter someone who is um, suicidal. So that's the majority. But then I always tell my audiences, there's another audience that I want to connect with. And that is the demographic of you who are suicidal and who are suffering today from crippling depression. I know you're out there. And there may even be somebody in here, in this room, which is full mostly of adults. On May 13th, 2013, I was here at the church, here at the office. Uh, at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon, my daughter Macy, who at that time was, I think, a sophomore at Friendship High School, texted me. She said, Dad, we can't find Jordan. Well... He was 19, uh, living the college life. He was still living at home. He was close to be moving out, but he was still at home. And for all I knew, he'd been up all night and was still sleeping. So I wasn't highly alarmed. Uh, so then about two hours later, she texted me again. And she said, Dad, we can't find him. And then she said something that really alarmed me. She said, and his friends can't get a hold of him. Okay. And I tell students, I said, there's a reason we as parents um, get scared when you don't answer your phone. And sometimes you get that lecture, why don't you answer your phone? I said, we just, we can't help it. We fear the worst. We love you. And you'll never understand that until you have children of your own. So we can't get a hold of Jordan. He's not answering his phone. He's not texting. So as a parent, I think I'm alarmed. I'm concerned, but he's going to be fine. So I hop in my car. I leave the church, head down slide road and go to my house. You know where we live on the corner of 80th and Frankfurt. I see Jordan's car is still there. I pull into the house, raise the garage door, because like many people, we, do, we rarely ever enter and exit through the front door. We go in through the garage. And so I went to the, through, uh, the garage door into the house, went to his bedroom door, and it's locked. I hollered his name, and I banged on the door. There's no answer. Well, as you can imagine, as a parent, now I'm, I'm very scared. And so I run to the kitchen to try to find something, a knife or something, to get that doorknob open. I finally get back to his room. I, I, I get that doorknob open. I throw it open. I look here. There's no one. I look here. There's no one. I look there. <clears throat> there. I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I keep thinking I'm going to be able to tell this story. Well, who am I fooling? It's always going to be hard. And there he was. I ran to him, I grabbed him, I, it, was, it was just a moment of insanity. I thought it was a mannequin. I, I could not separate fiction from reality. And uh, I screamed his name over and over. I realized that he was dead. I ran out of my house onto the driveway, which empties into Frankfurt. I fell on the ground, I'm on all fours. I am hitting the concrete driveway as hard as I can, screaming, my son is dead. My son is dead. A nice, a nice man pulls into my driveway and gets out. And before he can even ask what is wrong, I'm screaming, my son is dead. To this day, I, that seems surreal. 
to say that. He called 911 in a few minutes. Uh, the police arrived. The ambulances, the, the authorities, the first responders, and hundreds of friends. Another reason I show this picture of my family is because even though I speak about it a lot, it's all of our story. It changed us all. And it's not only impacted us, it has impacted his friends. We still counsel with many of his friends today. So I tell kids on a regular basis, I'm not a licensed professional counselor. I don't have a degree in psychiatry or psychology. What I am is just a, a dad and a husband with a story, a very painful story and lessons I have learned from that very painful experience. So I start off with just a few things about awareness. For those of you who rarely, if ever, think about the topic of suicide, let me just kind of bring you up to speed. One week after Jordan took his life, this was the front page of Newsweek magazine, the suicide epidemic. One year later, just a year and a half ago, New York Times ran a full-page story with the title, U.S. Suicide Rate Surges to a 30 year high. This is one year ago. Then, last October, Newsweek again comes out with another cover article. Teen suicide is contagious and the problem may be worse than we thought. Well, there are other articles I could go on and on, but statistics are kind of um, removed from us, kind of abstract. A year ago, August, I got a call from, I was a youth pastor for most of my life, really still am. Um, I do all their weddings now and talk to a lot of them on a regular basis. Um, but I've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teenagers in youth ministries of mine over the years. So I got a call from a parent of one of those students that I had in a youth group at Southcrest uh, around the year 2000. She called. She's weeping. She said, Nick, the, name was, the boy's name was Brian. He's now 32 at this time. She said, Brian is dead. He took his life last night. She's weeping. We visit. She said, can you please preach his funeral? Of course. So last, a year ago, August, at Lake Ridge Chapel, I preached that boy's funeral. <clears throat> Incidentally, last May, I preached another funeral of a former youth of mine who also took his life. Anyway, after that funeral in August a year ago, uh, Joyce Rowe was working there. And, of course, I was exhausted emotionally. And I went out and talked to Joyce just for a minute. I don't even know if you remember this. But I just said, how many of these do you all see, these funerals for folks who have taken their lives? She's, I'll never forget her response. She said, we've had three this week. So we see these articles of, for statistics around the nation. But I just want you to know, it's real right here at home. And then there's uh, Dr. James Dobson, who sort of brings the focus down just a tad uh, in regard to these statistics. This is last month. Topic for my letter this month is one that strikes terror into the hearts of the nation's parents. I would heavily amen that. The issue is suicide among teens and young adults. Anyway, he goes on to... Um, uh, specify within these statistics of the 30-year surge in suicides for all ages that we have a 40-year high among older teens and the suicide rate for girls doubled between 2007 and 2015. I really think this has a lot to do with social media and bullying online. We'll get to that in just a moment. And then we have our good friend from Netflix, 13 Reasons Why. I won't spend much time on this. What I will tell you is that this came out in late March. Uh, in early April, I got an email from a mental health uh, professional from a neighboring school district, and they said, have you seen this? I know you talk about suicide. Your son took his life. And I said, I don't know what you're talking about. I've never heard of 13 Reasons Why. Well, it's a Netflix series. I immediately looked it up, and I watched all 13 episodes. Um, it is a 13-episode series. All the episodes connect, build on one another, uh, about a fictitious young lady, teenager, named Hannah Baker. She uh, explains 13 reasons why she took her life. The thing climaxes the last episode with her taking her life. 
by the time I got to that episode and saw that and her parents came in, I screamed. The acting was outstanding. The series was horrific. And after it was over, I rushed up here to the church. It was 9 p.m. on a Saturday night. I knew that I had to send out a warning to school counselors, to parents, to teachers, to other youth pastors who weren't aware of this thing. And I needed to tell them that this thing is both dark and dangerous. Dark because it offers no help whatsoever. They portray the counselor at the high school in the, in the story as inept and incompetent. They don't even really portray depression accurately. In fact, one teenager said, they've taken sort of what I feel and made it entertainment. It's not even really what I feel. And then it's dangerous because the number of teenagers who are watching it who themselves are mentally hurting. So you could take someone who's doing great and they're mentally doing very, very well and they could watch it. And I told them in this blog that I wrote, go ahead and watch it, but make sure you watch it with somebody. And then I told parents, if you have a teenager who's watching it, you watch it with them or you watch it on your own. Because there will be those who are not well, who, do, who are suffering from depression or some other debilitating mental, mental uh, disorder. And you know what? They watch this and it becomes their reality. And they connect with those characters and now that character is them. And you may say, Nick, seriously, it's just a Netflix series. Okay, I got a note from a dad in Indiana. He said, Nick, I need you to pray for my friend. He has a friend who's a dad. He said his 15-year-old son just took his life after writing letters to friends of his who had bullied him. And he patterned it after that series right there. Man, the list goes on and on and on. Well, that blog I wrote, just in a, a few minutes' time, sent it out. I've never had a blog go viral, but that one did. It was seen by over 200,000 people in 54 different countries. Two of the local TV stations did stories on it. It was... Uh, it was surprising to me, but then again, not so surprising. This next thing I want to address is something I don't, I'm not able to address in public schools. I had a student come up to me after one of my talks at a public school, and it was just me and him. And this is great when they're able to come up afterwards. Today at Wayland, after we were done, I had a line of students wanting to ask questions and wanting to visit. And this happens uh, from time to time when I'm allowed time to visit with these kids. <clears throat> Uh, but this one came up, he said, Mr. Watts, if a person dies by suicide, do they go to hell? Now let me stop there for a minute and just tell you, there are seven suicides recorded in Scripture, ending with the suicide of Judas. But I'll tell you what I heard a preacher say one time, and it's spot on. Just because the Bible records something doesn't mean God necessarily approves it. Suicide is always wrong. At its heart, it's murder of yourself. However, <laughs> Suicide is not an unpardonable sin. In fact, it's covered just as much as any other sin that's covered by the blood of the Lamb. So if we ask God the question, if a person dies by suicide, do they go to hell? Well, let's let God answer that. Paul said, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation, this would include suicide, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. In short, nothing, not a zero, has the power to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ regardless of the manner in which we meet him face to face. Somebody ought to say amen. I was online and in a debate with a, a girl who found me. She, I don't know, she lives far away from Texas. But she read one of my blogs called Suicide and the Bible and how I address this clearly from a theological framework. She just couldn't get past that. She said, but Nick, suicide's murder. And I said, well, at its heart, sure it is. But I said, are you saying murderers just have a beeline to hell that that's impartable sin? I said, let's follow that logic. That means Moses is in hell. That means Paul is in hell because he ordered murders. And really, let's take it even to Matthew chapter 5 when Jesus said, you've heard it said you shall not murder, but I tell you that murder is equal to being angry with your brother or sister. And even if you're angry, you'll be subject to the same judgment. So really what that means is that we're all in a world of hurt if that's the unpardonable sin.
Listen, the only unpardonable sin is to reject faith in Jesus Christ. It is not how you die. It is the condition of your soul that matters. And the blood of Christ, the Bible tells us, covers all sin. So let's just settle that. If there were anybody in the room just thinking that, because that is a satanic lie that has no scriptural basis whatsoever, search the scriptures, all 66 books. Not only will you not find that people who commit suicide go to hell, you will find just the opposite. Folks, my son and people who've died just like him, more alive than they've ever been in paradise. So I attended a conference last Thursday on suicide intervention at Texas Tech. They're at the uh, Cultural Center uh, adjacent to uh, UMC. One of the uh, mental health professionals got up there and he shared some myths associated, associated with suicide. I thought it was very good. I want to share them with you here. One myth is that once you're suicidal, you're always suicidal. That's not true at all. I've shared with most of you in 2015, I just about lost my mind. It was two years after Jordan died. We had the triggers again. He died in May. <clears throat> then we had uh, Mother's Day, Father's Day. Then we had his birthday. And it just went downhill from there. And I became very suicidal. I had a plan. I wanted out. I was done. Michelle, bless her heart. <laughs> I'd gone home in the middle of the afternoon and went to bed. I was so severely depressed. She woke me up. She said, Nick, Jason, our pastor, he's in the living room, and so are some of our friends, and I'm taking you to the hospital. Of course, I said, no, you're not. She said, yes, I am. She won. And so she took me, and I was admitted to the psychiatric ward at Covenant Medical Center for nine days. I met some wonderful people. Did you know that all the furniture is bolted to the floor there? <laughs> I don't know how many times I tried to pull my seat up to the table. You would think I would remember that the seat is bolted to the floor. We, we had craft time uh, I, with sand and glue and all kinds of stuff. When I got out, I threw that away. Michelle jerked it out of the trash. We still have that as a memento. Oh my goodness, I was suicidal. But does that mean I was always suicidal? No, I'm doing fantastic today. It took a while to get through that, but I'm doing great. And that applies to everyone. Just because you're once suicidal doesn't mean you're there forever. Number one, talking about suicide is a bad idea. That's another myth. We're talking about it right now. Absolutely, you don't want to spend all your time talking about dying. No one is going to want to be around you. But on occasion, especially in light of the statistics I showed you earlier, nationally and locally, yes, there are times, and I'm telling you, schools are getting it. Why else do you think, I, Michelle and I keep getting these invitations to come speak and to come help. People are wanting to talk about it, and they want to talk about it now, and it's a good idea. Number three, only people with mental disorders are suicidal. I would agree that probably that applies to most people because at the time and, and moment you take your life, I believe with all of my heart that you have now disconnected from the logical part of your brain because you can't think this through. We'll get to more of that in a little bit. But it doesn't mean that you've been diagnosed with some mental disorder uh, if someone has committed suicide. Maybe they were just doing wonderful. There's no rhyme or reason to it. Number four, people who talk about suicide do not mean it. That is absolutely false. As a youth pastor, anytime we were at a camp or a retreat away, and if some kid said, I think I'm going to kill myself, I'm telling you what, that kid was snatched up immediately. We called their parents, and we got them as quickly as possible. We always erred on the side of caution because we know that people, some, not all, but some, some are just trying to get attention, but you don't know who those are. And so we always are on the side of caution because we do know they do mean it. Number five, someone who is suicidal is determined to die. That is 100% false. Here's why. 99% of those who attempt suicide don't want to die. They just want the pain to stop. Never forget that. 99% of people who attempt suicide, they don't want to die. I have no doubt. People ask me all the time, what was Jordan thinking? He wasn't thinking. I think Jordan just wanted to go to sleep. <laughs> he didn't have the cognitive skills at that moment to comprehend that 
he was not going to wake up. He just wanted the pain to stop. Let's talk about that pain for just a minute. Because depression is the disorder uh, most associated with suicide, we're going to address that just for a few moments. I've been open with you before. I was diagnosed with clinical depression in 1999. I've been treated for it ever since. My dad, I believe with all my heart, suffered from clinical depression. He medicated his depression with alcohol. He became a very violent alcoholic, finally dying of alcoholism in the year 2000 at the age of 57. There are two types of depression, and I always make sure that the students understand what I'm talking about. There is situational depression. That's what we all get. The typical down day, had a, you got bad news at work, or you didn't get the promotion, or it's a heartbreak or a disappointment, Some, your boyfriend, girlfriend broke up with you, a teenager doesn't get into the college they want, so forth and so on, the blues, the blahs, that sort of thing, but you eventually come out of it. What I'm talking about here is clinical depression or major depressive disorder. Dr. Dan Blazer is the professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at Duke University Medical Center. He defines clinical depression as this, emotionally and psychologically crippling, debilitating, incapacitating. In short, it is painful. It is a form of suffering. The 17th century English scholar from Oxford, Richard Burton, said, if there is a hell on earth, it is to be found in a depressed heart. I can attest to this personally. If you've never, ever suffered from depression, thank God Almighty, I couldn't be more grateful. But there is no way, no possible way to comprehend and understand it unless you've been there. In fact, and I'm ashamed of this today, bef when, before 1999, I would, I would mock it. I would make fun of it. Oh, you're on medicine for depression. Uh, and I'll I'll address that in just a moment. But I tell you folks, it is real. Clinical depression, by the way, is a medically diagnosed malady. It is real. It is a, a chemical imbalance, a misfiring of the synapses in the brain. My family physician, who is a Christian, he helped me through this because I, I really wrestled with that, not only being a Christian, but a pastor. I can't believe I'm not going to do that. I, I can't even fathom me being on any type of medication for that. He said, Nick, if so, he said, number one, you won't believe how many pastors I treat. Number two, he said, if someone comes in with a thyroid issue, he said, I don't tell them to pray more. There's medication for that. If they come in with diabetes, I don't tell them to read their Bible more. There's medication for that. He said, clinical depression is just as much a diagnosed malady or illness as those. It's just that people can't see it. And so it's hard to comprehend or understand. I read an article not too long ago uh, about people who suffer from this level of depression. And by the way, let me take a time out. There are those who, I haven't met any here. I'll tell you what, Bacon Heights is an awesome place. I've always told people that church shouldn't be defined or described as a club for saints, but a hospital for sinners. And Bacon Heights has been an ICU for the Watts family. I remember early on not being able to get out of bed and uh, especially on Sunday mornings and the last thing I wanted to do was come and sing about and hear about God. But when I got here I never wanted to leave. I never wanted it to be over. This place, God, Christ, has used you in more ways than you can possibly comprehend. But there are those, some places, who uh, are dismissive about this thing called depression. You shouldn't have depression. You're a Christian. Smile. Jesus loves you. It's those people I want to give the right hand of fellowship. Um, and I want to remind them, my friend, we have an entire book in our Old Testament entitled Lamentations, a whole book about being depressed and lonely and distraught. The psalmist wrote, darkness is my closest friend. Listen, it's real, and God knows all about it, and it's okay with him. 
So I read this article. In fact, Neil Anderson, who's a, who's a great theologian uh, and a counselor, he said, we need both the church and the hospital. It was a great, great balance. I read this article about these people who were severely depressed, and they did their best in a sentence or two to describe depression. And so for those of you who have not been there, this will give you some insight. Number one, one person said, I feel as though I died a few weeks ago, and my body hasn't found out yet. Another person said this, it's like drowning, except you can see everyone around you breathing. So this connection from depression to suicide. The Associated Press ran an article back in October of 2014, a little over a year after Jordan died, and they wrote this. Suicide is a decision made out of desperation, hopelessness, isolation, and loneliness. And this is a very good statement. The black hole that is clinical depression is all consuming. Everything closes in. Nothing makes sense. Feeling like a burden to loved ones. Feeling like there is no way out. Feeling trapped and feeling isolated are all common among people who suffer from depression. So, for those who have not been there, and again, I thank God if you haven't, um, I want to share with you five things not to say to someone who is suffering from severe depression. These, the, this advice is given to us by Dr. Adam Kaplan, an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Neurology at Johns Hopkins University. So he says, number one, don't say this. I know how you feel. At first sight, you may think, well, that's a genuine thing to say. It is, and you probably mean it genuinely, but it couldn't be more false. You don't know how they feel. Also, if you have someone who is at risk, uh, someone who's on the proverbial cliff, all they need is one more poke in the chest, and they're gone. They're making the decision to take their life. The focus is on them. If you say something like, I know how you feel, all of a sudden the focus is on me now. Do you see where I'm going? The focus needs to be on them. And also, this kind of response uh, seems to suggest that we have a single answer. But it's almost impossible to convey to a person who has not had depression what it is like. A depressed person suffers a type of anguish that is unique and in its own way can be as painful as anything else that can happen. So resist saying something like, I know how you feel, because even if you've suffered severe pain, their pain is going to be unique, and we need to focus on them. The next thing is suck it up, cheer up, get over it. Folks, I have said these things to people, and I'm so ashamed now. Telling someone to be cheery isn't going to do much. In fact, it's just going to make them feel worse. It's invalidation. It's dismissive. And I'll promise you this, from someone who suffers and wrestles with depression, listen, if someone who is severely depressed could cheer up or suck it up or get over it, they would have already. No one in their right mind wants to be in that, what one author calls, that stubborn darkness. It is a terrifying place, a, horf, a suffocating place. So if they could, they would have already. One doctor told me this, and it's fantastic. He said, Nick, if someone, if someone tells somebody suffering from depression to suck it up, cheer up, or get over it, it is the same as looking at a double amputee and saying, get up and walk. It is impossible. Another thing you don't want to say to someone who is depressed it's all in your head. Now, sure, that's where the brain is located, but it is far deeper than that. The person who says that simply needs, simply needs to become educated in regard to clinical depression. J.B. Phillips, uh, who's the 20th century theologian and author, said, I beg you not to be unmindful of the unseen and awful, often inexpressible sufferings of others. This kind of statement is just invalidating, dismissive, and it could be the last little poke that that person needs to have a reason to end it all. 
And then the last one is, just think, there are others who have it worse than you. Again, that's taking the focus off of them, and let's place it on some fictional person we don't even know. There's someone out there who has it worse than you. Probably so. Um, but that doesn't help at all. That's like going up to a swimming pool, and there's a child, and they're drowning. But you look at them and go, you know what? There's probably someone else in another swimming pool who's having it worse than you are. That's about the, the, the sanity and the rationale and the logic with that statement. There may be, but th that's not our focus. Our focus is this drowning person. So, as we continue, um, triggers for major depression. Well, there are all kinds. Any type of abuse, verbal, emotional, sexual, all of those types of things. All kinds of trauma. Trauma can result from those, that abuse. Prolonged relational stress, and I put here parents' divorce, and here's why. One of the mental health professionals last week at Texas Tech, when they spoke, she, she worked specifically with children. She said, I cannot tell you how many children come in who have been traumatized. I, I'm a child of divorce. Man, it was, it was horrific. These stories about mom and dad got divorced and they're still friends, I, 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 don't, I don't know that story. Mine was horrible. Uh, dad was very violent. Uh, and it was, uh, it's not something I enjoy remembering at all. Um, but she said, um, there are so many children who come in and have believed and have been told that the divorce was their fault. And they are suffering severely. And they've fallen into deep, dark depression. They believe it. So I always tell the students, if you're like me, grew up in home, mom and dad didn't make it, it was not your fault. It was not then, it's not now, it never will be. That's mom and dad, you let them sort that out. Humiliation, bullying and cyberbullying. I mentioned bullying a little while ago. Pat, Patty Sisko is a former counselor at Grand Prairie High School. Michelle and I used to serve at First Baptist Church Grand Prairie, had a wonderful time there. For those of you who don't know, Grand Prairie is sandwiched between Dallas and Arlington. She wrote an editorial for the Dallas Morning News on teen suicide. In that article, she wrote, and I quote, Cruel words are like a knife in the heart. She said, many of us adults endured some type of bullying as kids, but nothing like the venom today's social media dishes out on a regular basis. I thank God we didn't have social media when I was a kid. I would have been... I'd have been expelled, put in jail. I, you don't want to give me a smartphone as a teenager. But in all seriousness, this bullying, and I, when I speak to students, man, I hammer this home. Um, back, in the, back when we were kids, if, you, if someone came in and, and the kid said, man, everybody hates me. Remember the parent would kind of look at, who is everybody? And there might be one, two, maybe even three. That was everybody. Today, when a kid says everyone hates me, it's everyone. It's the World Wide Web. This is David Moloch. I was also made aware last Thursday at that conference of Senate Bill 179, which was signed by Governor Greg Abbott this past summer and went into effect as a law in the state of Texas this past September 1st. It's commonly known as David's Law. David Moloch was a 16-year-old student at Alamo Heights High School in San Antonio. He was on the receiving end of so much online bullying and experienced so much psychological torture from that, he killed himself. Let me just let that hang there for a minute. There's a pledge, it's called the David's Law Pledge, that students take today, and it's simply a sentence. They pledge, they say this, quote, I pledge to never use my device as a weapon. This law now, if uh, it is proven that you have in any way bullied a teenager, a student, a child, and they have either committed suicide or attempted suicide, you can be tried, convicted, and sentenced to up to a year in prison and fined $4,000. I'm very grateful 
that that law is on the books. People always ask me, Nick, what are the signs of someone who's suicidal? Well, as I explained this morning to the students in Plainview, there are people who can have one or two of these signs, but they're not necessarily suicidal. But these are some common signs. For instance, this first one, I can't do this anymore. Our daughter, Macy. This is the time of the semester in college when college students are are ready to quit. It's midterm. They've usually taken on more extracurricular activity than, than they can handle. They are stressed to the max. Macy called us two nights ago in tears. I just don't know if I can do this. Well, she's not suicidal. But some people who are will say things like this. I can't do this anymore. I just want to sleep and not wake up. I just want it all to stop. Any, anything expressing one's desire to no longer live. The moods that are quite common, depression that we've already addressed, it's the most common condition associated with suicide. Isolation from family and friends. I think a lot about the day before Jordan took his life. It was Mother's Day. We had lunch together. We decided to go to a movie that afternoon, but he wanted to go be by himself. So he met a friend for coffee, but even then, it was one of his best friends. He left there and went home, shut his door, and he was there until he died. Isolation, withdrawal from activities, loss of interest, sleeping too much or too little. Typically, it's, it's too much because you just, you don't have, you don't have the, the, the emotional strength to face the normal every day. You feel like a burden to others. You feel trapped. And of course, the final stepping off point is hopelessness. So let's address the intervention. We've heard statistics. We've talked about uh, depression and uh, things of that nature. So what can we do? What can you do? Well, on a general scale, number one, just be present. Here's what I mean by that. Several years ago, Macy, when Macy was still, she was in either middle school or early high school. Something great had happened at school that day, I don't know. But I walked into the house, and I remember hearing Michelle say, there's Dad, tell him what happened. So I walk into the kitchen, and I hear some murmuring, something in the distance, but I'm checking my email. I'm checking texts. The next thing I hear is Michelle. She says, Macy... Just stop. Dad's not listening. I wasn't present. And I tell students, I said, you know what? Put your phone down. Take a look around you. My son was as normal as the rest of you. Somebody at immediate risk could be sitting next to you right this moment. Be present. Notice. Take a look around from time to time. Next, be willing. And here's what I mean by that. We commonly say, if you need anything, just let me know. And it's a genuine statement. We mean that. But remember the child drowning in the swimming pool? I can see you're drowning. If you need anything, just let me know. Here's a better statement. I can see you're struggling. I'm here for you. Can we get through this together? You see the difference? The first, listen, their brain is broken. They can't let you know. They don't, they, they don't have the mental capacity. They don't have the emotional courage to let us know. And so we have to take it upon ourselves to say, I'm here. I can see something is wrong. I can't put my finger on it. And you know what? I tell the kids, err on the side of caution. If they're mad at you right now, so what? They'll be grateful later. And you could tell them, we're going to get some help. I'm here. I'm not leaving. We're going to get through this together. I think about the Good Samaritan. What if the story Jesus told had gone like this? The Levite passed on one side, the priest passed on one side, and the Good Samaritan rode upon the man who had been beaten and robbed, looked down from his horse and said, if you need anything, 
So let me know. Took off. No, you know what he did? He said, I, I see you're in pain. I'm here. I'm going to help you get through this. Oh, my friends. Let's look at practical helps on a specific level now. We've talked about in general. What can we do specifically? The Houston Chronicle ran an article on suicide in a little over a year ago in, in May. And they wrote this. The key to managing grief, mental illness, and suicidal thoughts is communication. In other words, getting the person at risk to learn how to talk, to communicate. Oftentimes, those who are struggling tend to isolate instead of communicate. That is 100% true. Through it all, communication is key to breaking out of the cycle of hopelessness and connecting to a support system. Sometimes the person at risk is at a place where they can't communicate, and it's then we must be their voice. In January, I attended a suicide intervention seminar in Canyon. It was at First Baptist Church Canyon. This was led by people who were trained in the ASSIST model, which stands for Applied Suicide Intervention Skills Training. And they gave us some questions to ask for a person who is, who is on that proverbial cliff. They're at the edge. Now, they made it clear that this model is not intended to be a one-and-done fix. It's never going to be that way. And they said, just because it may, this may work on one person doesn't mean it'll work on every person. But they said, listen, when you've identified this person who is at immediate risk of danger, they're on that proverbial cliff, and they've got one foot off. Be gentle, compassionate, non-judgmental. And they said, start off with this question. Are you considering taking your life? Now, at first glance, you may think, why in the world would you ask that? You've already figured that out. Because, listen, they're not talking. They're not communicating. I, as I, <laughs> Michelle and I have talked about this. At some point, Jordan put together the steps to kill himself. Of course, this was just between him and him. These, these people who are at immediate risk of danger, they're not talking. It is now closed in. The vault is locked. They are putting it together right now. They have a plan and they're working on the steps. So to be able to just look at them and say, are you considering taking your life? Hearing that out loud and for them to hopefully perhaps say, yes, I'm considering taking my life. It sends off a DEFCON 4 alarm. All of a sudden, it's out there. They now hear themselves saying for the first time, I'm considering taking my life. Second thing, why do you want to die? Again, non-judgmental, tender, compassionate. You're handling them with like they're the most fragile thing on the planet. You're not saying... Why would you want to die? Listen, they're not thinking logically. Why do you want to die? It's an honest question. Again, you want to get them talking because they're not talking to anyone. And they begin to share, hopefully. Now, if they resist, are you considering taking your life? And they shrug their shoulders, I don't know. All you do is say, look, I'm not going anywhere. Until we settle this, I'm not satisfied. I can't be satisfied with that answer. I've got to know, are you considering taking your life? So you get through that. Why do you want to die? So here's the neat thing that I learned at this seminar. While they're talking about why they want to die, we're listening to reasons why they want to live. For instance, I just can't put my family through this anymore. You know what I hear? They love their family. They love their family. So you're listening, and you're connecting these dots. And then, after they're through, and they may only say a few words, but at least they're talking, you say, 
what I'm hearing you say is that part of you wants to die. You're acknowledging that part of you. But I'm also hearing you say that part of you wants to live. Could I be right? Gentle, tender, could I be right? So we need to protect the part of you that wants to live. In 1998, a movie came out called Patch Adams. When I speak to teenagers, I tell them, you weren't even born in 1998. Ask your parents about it. It's a great movie. Now, I've picked this clip. It's a, a clip of only two, two minutes and 45 seconds. But I picked it for a reason. That Robin Williams is the star of the movie is coincidental. And I always ask the students, do you know how Robin Williams died? All of them know he committed suicide. So let me set up the clip, and then I'll... Uh, bring a couple of implications for that, and we'll close out, close out our evening together. So, Hunter Patch Adams, uh, a real guy, a real doctor. Michelle bought me his biography years ago. It's called Gazoon Height. I read it, and he really did spend Halloween and some days following in a psychiatric ward. I totally get that now. Um, did I mention that the furniture is bolted to the floor? <laughs> <laughs> every psychiatric ward has what they call a day room that's where you practically spend your entire day when you're not having group or meeting with psychologists or whatever but that's where you go you watch television they may have a ping pong table you have crafts do all kinds of things but that's where you are all day so robin williams spent his time and can i tell you this almost everybody in that psych ward when i was in there just like you and me. Most of them were detoxing from some sort of drug addiction. Some of them had just been through a rough patch and had become suicidal. But it was just like talking to anybody else. There are just so many hurting people in this world. I visited a former youth of mine just two weeks ago in the psych ward. And I was grateful. I, told Michelle, I called Michelle. I was weeping. I said, so much emotion. But I was able to tell this former youth of mine, you couldn't be in a better place. They're going to take care of you. I know this from personal experience. So, Robin Williams. In this day room, he keeps running into a cantankerous older man named Arthur. Arthur is actually a genius. But he keeps walking around to everybody in the day room with four fingers. And he goes, how many fingers do you see? How many fingers do you see? If you saw the movie, you, you know. And, of course, everyone keeps saying, Arthur, there's four fingers. No, no. And they just kind of write him off as being crazy. So one night, Patch Adams decides he, he needs to know the answer to that question. How many fingers do you see? Here's a clip. Oh, what a great clip. What a tremendous clip. Here are the implications I want to draw from that. Someone who is severely depressed, suffering from a, a level of depression that is not your everyday depression, all they can see is depression, despair, loneliness, hopelessness. That's all they can see. You and I, our job is to help them see beyond the fingers. Hope, Jesus, their family, love, to see beyond the problem. That's what we do with people who are suffering at this level. The other implication I bring out of this is that and I always tell the kids, I said, who helped Patch see beyond the fingers? Was it a doctor, psychiatrist, professional? It was another patient. <laughs> you don't have to be a mental health professional. You don't have to have experience in mental health disorders. God's gifted all of us with the ability to love and to help one another. You shouldn't be scared of it. So I always end my talks like this. Let's say it's May 12th, 2013. Sorry. <clears throat> That's the day before Jordan took his life. And I always tell the students, let's say Jordan's sitting right next to you. This is one, he has less than 24 hours to live. What do I wish 
that speaker would have said that day. Well, interesting thing happened. Last Thursday, the first speaker of the day at that conference at Texas Tech was a lady named Kristen Anderson. Now, she's in her mid-30s now. But when she was 17, just outside of Chicago, she was extremely depressed. She had been sexually assaulted earlier in her life. She had fallen into severe, severe depression, major depressive disorder. People were dismissing her, invalidating her. It's not that she wanted to die. She just wanted the pain to stop. And so what did she do? She walked to the train tracks and laid down. As the train approached, 33 cars ran over her. Severed her legs here and here. Somehow, she survived. Somehow, she survived. It was after that that she professed her faith in Christ. God saved her to save her and through her to save others. After she got through talking and sharing her story, she took questions. There was a question here or there. I was on the front row, mostly because I got there late, and that was all that was left. <laughs> the good Baptist meeting. <laughs> you got to get there early, get the back seats. Raise my hand. Yes. I said, ma'am, this is very hard for me. I said, my 19-year-old son succeeded. I said, I've often wondered what I could have, should have, something I could have said prior to him taking his life. And as I speak at schools, those kids who are on that edge of the cliff, I said, I can't ask my son. I said, but I can ask you. I said, what did you need to hear before you chose to take your life? She rattled off this. You are loved. You matter. Your loss would be devastating. You're here for a reason. Talk and keep talking. There is hope and there is help. Folks, I sat in my office on Monday with a 19-year-old boy who suffers from depression. He sat down. First thing I told him, I said, I could tell. He was very fragile. I said, number one, I want you to know you matter. Huge tears came down his cheeks. There's so much pain in this world. Anyway, these are the things that she shared. And then I want to quote my wife. And I quote her every time I speak to kids. And I tell them, if you're one of these people on that edge of the cliff, then right when we're done, run. Don't walk to the nearest counselor, loved one, trusted friend, teacher, somebody who can help you because your loss will devastate your family and your friends. You matter. Then I always put this up at the end. I always remind them of the common phrase, popular phrase, familiar. Suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Of course, someone who's on that edge and in that stubborn darkness, they think it's a permanent problem. Because remember, 99% of people who attempt suicide, they don't want to die. They just want the pain to stop. And I'm always making sure that they know what the suicide hotline is. And then I always make sure they know uh, my blog site, because through that blog site, you can also find out. I work at Bacon Heights. You go to that website, and then you can email me and contact me. And I remind them of several blogs I have in there on the topics of suicide and depression. So one mental health professional asked me one time, after I started speaking on this topic at different schools, she looked at me, she said, why on earth would you put yourself through this psychological torture? Good question. Here's why. My first time to ever speak came in January of 2015. It was at the Lubbock Civic Center. It was called uh, Summit uh, Region 17. It was for uh, high school students, leaders at their schools from all over the region. 
They said, Nick, you'll speak three times, 30 minutes at a time on this topic. Had never done it, didn't want to do it. This is a ministry Michelle and I never asked for, never wanted. But I said, okay. And the students chose topics they wanted to be able to go and sit on. One of them was suicide. They're talking about it, so we might as well as well. So I got in there three times. I was a blubbering idiot. I, I, I couldn't get through. Understand, this was not too long after Jordan took his life, and I... It would be it's six months before I went into the hospital. I was not in a good place. But anyway, I gave my story as best as I could. I sure didn't have a PowerPoint presentation. It was just kind of throw it out there and hope somebody catches it, you know. But I spoke three times. After I was done, I thought, what a waste of time. You know, students, they're looking at you, and you don't know if they're listening. I, you don't know. They, the students are very intimidating. I was in youth ministry for all those years, and you can sit there and give them your best, and you think, they think I'm an idiot. And some of them may well think that. But that's what I thought. I was very defeated when I left, so I went home. The next day, I got an email from Kristen Lewis, who's a counselor at Monterey High School. I tell this story every place that I speak. She said, We have a student here in our office who heard you speak yesterday. They came by today to tell us the following. They said, Last night, I swallowed a bottle of pills to take my life. But then, I made myself throw up because I couldn't stop thinking about that man who lost his son. Then she said, That student is now receiving the help they need. That's why Michelle and I do this. That's why we do this. We come to the end of our time together. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <clears throat> I want you to know, my friends, and these are also things I couldn't say in a public school. We mess things up in Eden in Genesis chapter 3. God warned us we didn't care. We told him to shove off, in essence, and in part, he did. And literally all hell broke loose. Not only did mankind become corrupt, as God said through Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 17, the heart of man is wicked and hopelessly deceitful. Not only did we corrupt ourselves, but all creation rebelled. <laughs> That's why we have hurricanes and volcanoes and wildfires and and, and, and what have you. That's why people show up at hotels and, 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 and shoot 50 plus people. It, we live in a fallen world. John recorded it in his first letter. He said, we know we're children of God and that the whole world is in the power of the evil one. But in Genesis 3, God says, I've got this. In Genesis 3, after we told God to shove off, he said, here's the consequences, but I'm going to put this back together. And one day, the heel will bruise the serpent's head. And one day, I will walk this planet. And I will die on a Roman cross. And I'll be buried in a borrowed tomb. And I'll lie in that grave for three days. But the grave can't hold me. And I'll bust that rock out of the way. One scholar described the, the, the removing of the rock as though someone had picked it up and moved it. And at that time, all heaven will break loose. This is the Jesus who told a grieving Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. Because of the cross empty tomb, our son is more alive than he's ever been. This same Jesus, and I close with this, on the night before he was crucified, you know the passage well, said, in this world you will have trouble. You will have depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, down days, hate, anger, confusion, he said, but take courage. 
I've overcome the world. And all the church said, amen. Pray with me. So God, we thank you for allowing us to come together and Lord, to talk about this very, very difficult topic. Father, I pray that if anybody's in here, Lord, who's on that edge, God, that you remind them that you got them. Lord, that you would hold them and they would sense your embrace and hear your voice. Oh God, we thank you that you are close to the brokenhearted and that you save those who are crushed in spirit and that the battle is the Lord's. In fact, now, because you won the battle overwhelmingly, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. So God, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you that even though we die because you're the resurrection and the life, yet shall we live. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For those who are hurting, Remind them that you've got them. Lord, for those of us who may well encounter somebody who's hurting in the coming days, help us to be ready and willing and prepared. We give you praise and we pray these things in the name of Christ. All God's people said, amen. Thank you all so much. <laughs> Next Wednesday night, come back. It won't be near as, uh, as heavy as this one. Hope to see you then. Thank you all.